All right, peace, family. It's none other than your brother, Professor Ace, AfricanCreationEnergy.com. Today, I'd like to talk about a topic is entitled The Science of Pseudoscience and Its Practical and Impractical Applications. Again, once again, the topic of this discussion today is entitled The Science of Pseudoscience and Its Practical and Impractical Applications. So, First off, let me say that science is the systematic study of nature. Everything in nature can be studied through science, including that which we qualify as pseudoscience. Pseudoscience can be scientifically studied. And in scientifically investigating what we call pseudoscience, there are some interesting outcomes that come out of that investigation. Um, and I'd like to share them with you today. So first of all, it's incorrect to think that pseudoscience is not based on evidence and not based on data, right? If pseudoscience was not based on any evidence, not based on any data, then it would be impossible to argue with someone who was promoting pseudoscientific ideas because they, they would have nothing to say, right? If you're ever in a debate with someone who promotes pseudoscientific ideas and you're presenting them with facts to support science, the person who's promoting pseudoscience will also be able to come back and present information <laughs> to support their pseudoscientific idea, right? So it's incorrect to think that pseudoscience is not based on evidence or it's not based on any data, right? On the contrary, what you find is that people who promote pseudoscientific ideas are actually capable of citing and presenting vast amount of data and information to support their argument. So it's important to distinguish the difference between pseudoscience and pseudo information. Pseudo information is basically just another word for misinformation, false information, incorrect information. It's important to distinguish the difference between pseudoscience and pseudo information, right? A pseudoscientist actually has evidence not misinformation, but actually has information. It could, be, it could be correct information that supports their pseudoscientific idea. But pseudo, pseudo information, false information, misinformation is e it's easily refuted. You just present the fact, right? You say that the apple is purple and then I, and then we bring forth the apple and it's either red or green. Case closed, right? Pseudo information is easily refuted with facts and information, right? But the reason people will like accept pseudo information is because they've learned over time for whatever reason to accept information coming from a particular source, right? They've learned over time to trust a particular source, right? And, you know, this is usually done because it could be a particular person who has shown some proficiency in a particular area. Right. And because that person has shown some particular proficiency and expertise in a particular area, people have learned to oh, I can I can take his word for it. I can I can accept I can accept what he's saying. I can trust him. I can believe him. I can believe what he's saying. And then for, if for whatever reason that source decides to start making up things, then that person is now presenting pseudo information or incorrect information. And people who have learned to trust that source are now falling for that pseudo information or misinformation. Right. I will provide a link in the description of this video below where there's an article that talks about um, the fact that misinformation or the acceptance and, and promotion of misinformation is more about the source you trust than it is what you think. Right. And it's it is trusting, accepting and believing in pseudo information or misinformation, which leads to people getting scammed, conned, hustled and finessed. Right. The word con man is short for confidence man. Right. Why? Why? Why is it a confidence man? Because for whatever reason, you have confidence in this particular person and then they go ahead and they present you with some pseudo information or some mis misinformation, which you in turn accept. And then later on, you find that was false. And now you're upset when it all started with the fact that you had confidence, you trusted, you believed in this person, in this source in the first place. Right. So 
So that's pseudo information. Pseudo information is just incorrect information, which is easily refuted. It's easily refuted with facts. Pseudo information is problematic, but it's not nearly as problematic as pseudoscience because pseudoscience is more sophisticated and we'll discuss it as we proceed. Right. So, again, it's incorrect to think that pseudoscience is not based on evidence. It is based on evidence. It is based on information. It is based on data. If it was not based on evidence, information, and data, you would not be able to debate with someone who promotes pseudoscience. It's also incorrect to assume that pseudoscience is not based on reason. Again, if pseudoscience was not based on reason, then you would be unable to have a discourse, a debate with someone who's promoting pseudoscience. But what you find is you find debates with people who promote pseudoscience. It's, it's not wholly unreasonable. It's not wholly illogical. Right. There are portions of the debate that is actually, you know, well thought out, even though they're promoting pseudoscience. So at the beginning of this year, I did a video called the nine types of reason and in that video I discussed the fact that there are different types of reason including inductive reasoning abductive reasoning and deductive reasoning when we scientifically analyze pseudoscience we can observe that pseudoscience does utilize inductive reasoning and abductive reasoning and that's why pseudoscience is so uh, uh, deceptive right because it is based on evidence it is based on experience and it is based on reason. Whoa. How can pseudoscience be based on evidence, experience and reason? These these things that uh, we have rhetorically repeated as as the foundation of science, but they also can be found within pseudoscientific ideas. Right. So if pseudoscience is based on evidence, experience and reason, then what exactly is pseudoscience? Let's define pseudoscience, right? So when we go to a definition of pseudoscience, it basically says a collection of beliefs or practices mistakenly regarded as being based on the scientific method. Mistakenly regarded as being based on the scientific method. So what is occurring? What If it's mistakenly based on the scientific method, then what method is being utilized in pseudoscience? What is the pseudoscientific method, right? I want to display a graphic that's found in the book, The Science of Sciences and the Science in Sciences. This graphic is a, a six-pointed star, and each point of the star is one of the words of investigation. Where, what, who, when, why, and how. Right. These are the six words of scientific investigation. Whenever we want to ask a question, whenever we're attempting to create a query, to go on a quest to create something, one of these questions is asked. Right. These six questions of investigation basically lead you into a different aspect of nature, space, matter, time and energy. Right. Where is a question about space? What and who is a question where the answer is matter? When is a question where the answer is time? Right. Where, what, who and when are all questions where the answer is descriptive. The answer is simply information and the answer to those questions can be right or wrong. When you get into the questions of why and how, those questions are generally explanatory, right? Those go into energy. The difference between the answers to the where, what, who, and when questions, the space, matter, and time questions versus the answers to the why and how questions, the energy questions, the difference between those questions is the difference between scientific laws and scientific theories, right? A scientific law is a mathematical description of information. Right. It's, it's merely a description. It's not explanatory. It's not an attempt to explain observations. It's merely a description where, what, who and when space, matter and time. When you get into how and why that energy that though the answers to those questions are scientific theories. Right. And so the difference between information versus explanation is also the difference between pseudo information and pseudoscience. Right. Pseudo information is just incorrect information. It's incorrect answers to the where, what, who and when questions. Pseudoscience is an incorrect methodology in answering the explanatory questions of how and why. Right. And so 
In a video that I did last year entitled Science is My Religion, the Electron is God, and, Sci and Scientists are Prophets, I described the pseudoscientific method, which I, I cut out of the final video that I posted, but I'm going to insert the excerpt of the description of the pseudoscientific method here and then uh, continue on with the discussion. But just like there are people who do not want to be bound by the constraints of religion and thus become spiritual, there are people who do not want to be bound by the constraints of science. Those who do not want to follow the system, those who do not want to follow the methodology, they do not want to be held accountable and thus they give birth to pseudoscience. See, I talk a lot about the scientific method, making a hypothesis, performing experiments or exposing yourself to experiences to gain evidence, either supporting or refuting your hypothesis, observing the results and coming to a conclusion, the scientific method. But there is also a pseudoscientific method. What is the pseudoscientific method? Well, there are different levels. The pseudoscientific method, just like the scientific method, both begin with the hypothesis, the educated guess. This is the stage of belief. This is the stage of not really knowing. But you formulate an idea of what you think may be the reason, cause, or explanation of something. Now, from this stage, the scientist would begin to gather all the information to either confirm or deny his or her hypothesis. However, from the hypothesis stage, the pseudoscientist would do one of two things. The pseudoscientist would either not gather any information, not gather any data to support their hypothesis, and then will go out and repeat their hypothesis, repeat what they think, repeat what they believe, repeat their opinion, like it's absolute fact without any evidence to support it. It may sound crazy, but many people do it. But that's the weakest form of pseudoscience. The most convincing form of pseudoscience, those pseudoscientific ideas that really gain traction, that really catch on, that get repeated and believed by the most people, they're usually created in this manner. From the hypothesis stage, the pseudoscientists will actually go out and gather data, go out and gather evidence. However, the pseudoscientists will only gather evidence, only gather data in support of their idea. And they will choose to ignore all evidence which challenges, disproves, or refutes their idea. But this is the most convincing form of pseudoscience because the person will actually be able to present you with evidence about why what they're saying is right. But they have failed to either research or present you with evidence about why what they're saying may be wrong. This is the most pervasive and persuasive and dangerous form of pseudoscience that most people fall a victim to. The pseudoscientist has not held themselves accountable and they have not been held accountable by their peers in terms of gathering and presenting all the information and data about the subject. In science, we call that confirmation bias. When you go out and look for information to prove yourself right and ignore information which may prove you wrong. The fear of being falsified. All right. So in the book, <clears throat> in the book, The Science of Sciences and the Science in Sciences, I talk about the um, scientific method and the mathematical method or the uh, empirical method and the rational method uh, with the four stages of the scientific method or the empirical method being hypothesis, experiment, experience and theories and the four stages of the rational or mathematic method being comprehension, analysis, synthesis and results and how those two methods work together to create a eight step method, which I call the science of sciences and the science and sciences, which is basically um, the scientific and mathematic or empirical and rational methods working together uh, with the eight steps being hypothesis, synthesis, experiments, results, experience, comprehension, theories, and analysis, right? So within those eight points of our scientific method, the point, the step where it goes off the rails, where the scientific method turns into the pseudoscientific method is at the point of experimentation, right? The point, of, the point of experimentation is the data collection step of the process. It's the inf information gathering step of the process, right? A scientist during the ex experimental phase will gather all the information, whether the information either supports or refutes, supports or falsifies the hypothesis, they gather that information. The pseudoscientists during that experimental phase, rather than letting the 
information rather than letting the data be the guide rather than letting the information guide the conclusion they let the hypothesis be the guide they let their beliefs be the guide and they seek out only the information which supports their idea they seek out only the information that proves themselves right they and they ignore any information which proves them wrong and so you know when you when you practice science what happens is you're you're actually more you're actually wrong more often than you are right in terms of your hypothesis you you know you you actually tend to make more incorrect hypotheses you had you actually have more ideas about the way the world works than are actually correct you're often proven wrong you're often falsified right but what happens when you follow the scientific method and you you go out seeking information to prove your hypothesis wrong and after gathering all the information you still can't find any information to prove you wrong then at that point you know you're right you mean you you say i have exhausted all the sources of information i have exhausted all the sources of data and there's no information there's no data that exists that disproves what i'm thinking so this thought must be right that's what that's what you call falsification right we we we've exhausted all efforts to to falsify to prove this wrong and we couldn't find anything thus it's right that's what you get out of the scientific method so with the scientific method you're often wrong <laughs> you're often wrong but when you're right utilizing the scientific method you know you're right because you've exhausted all information to try to prove yourself wrong it doesn't exist so you know you're right with the pseudo scientific method because you put a filter on the information that you gather and you only gather information that proves what you think or what you feel that proves the hypothesis right because you've only went out to prove yourself you've only um look for information and look for data to prove yourself right the outcome of that can be either positive or negative right you don't you can't really have confidence you can using that type of myth, math, methodology using the pseudo scientific methodology you can't really have confidence that your in conclusion is correct because you didn't you didn't go out to try to you didn't try to prove yourself wrong you only tried to prove yourself right you only tried you only look for the information that was set, that would prove your idea right pseudo science is a methodology which creates a win-win scenario right no matter no matter what you do you're right no matter what you do you you win and in our current atmosphere where egos are fragile pseudo science can take hold very quickly because it is 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 set up to make you to make you feel like you're right oh here's the data here's the data that proves what i'm saying and why i'm why i'm saying it is correct and you know what's what's so um what's so ill about pseudo science is that you're actually taught the pseudo scientific method in school like when you're when you're learning how to write a, a persuasive paper in your language arts classes either in high school or college right what what does the teacher say the teacher says think of a topic and then give examples that support your idea that's 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 the definition of pseudo science you have an idea and you go out and you look for information that proves your idea right <laughs> so and 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 because you're taught that you can go forward from that thinking i'm following proper methodology but you have to check the nuance that is something that is taught in language arts that's not something that's taught in your natural science courses right but even you know even in the professional world i've seen where people utilize pseudo scientific ideas like when they're pre presenting to their um stakeholders they're presenting to board members they curate data they they select when you say curate data like a curator of a museum is the person who puts together the different displays that are supposed to appear in the, in the museum and you know they they pick and choose um what to present right and at in within the professional world e even within the scientific professional world people curate their data they curate their information they pick and choose the information that is favorable to present pseudoscience is pervasive
It's pervasive within this world. You know what I'm saying? Even 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 within the scientific community, I've seen it. <laughs> right. And, and when and so when we understand what is occurring during the pseudoscientific method, we can identify when and where it occurs and hopefully guard ourselves from it. So uh, in one of the videos I did called The Electron is God, I talk about how, you know, basically how the electron is the only empirical object that I've been able to identify that best matches with the theological definition of what God is. Right. And since the electron is the substance of our thoughts, meaning, you know, our thoughts are electrical impulses within our brain. So electrons make up the substance of our thoughts. So a scientific method, a scientific methodology, a scientific thought process is a way in which we learn about God. It's brought on, it's created by God, and it also enables us to learn about God, right? And so if we were to personify the eight phases of the scientific and mathematic method, the science of sciences and the science and sciences, the empirical and rational method, if we were to personify those eight phases, right? You know, it's again during the experimental phase where the scientific method transforms into a pseudoscientific method, right, which is detrimental and can actually take us away, take us away from the path of science and getting to know God. Right. And so I liken I liken this to the religious concept of the seven archangels and the fallen angel who was Satan. Right. Within religion, Satan once was an angel. Right. So if you if you count Satan amongst the other seven archangels, you have eight. And when Satan rebelled, that's what gave birth to uh, evil in the world. Right. And so if we were to personify these different eight steps, you know, we could say that it's during the experimental phase where, you know, if that experimental phase starts becoming biased, if that experimental phase starts only trying to prove itself right and not trying to prove itself wrong, then it's that experimental step. It's that experimental angel that becomes the fallen angel that becomes Satan. Right. And so that's why the graphic for this video, um, and, you know, I use the picture of Satan. I, you know, I said pseudoscience is Satan. The word Satan means adversary, opposition or one who plots against another. Right. Satan seeks to seduce humans into falsehood and sin. That's exactly what pseudoscience does. It seeks to seduce us into falsehood. Because pseudoscience is based on evidence, experience, and reason, it's very tricky. It can, it can seduce you into accepting and, and believing something that is incorrect. Within religion, they say that Satan whispers and affects the minds of all people at some point in time. Well, that's what pseudoscience does. Pseudoscience affects the mind of every person on this planet at some point in time. And there's an evolutionary explanation for that, which we'll discuss later on. So because pseudoscience is based on evidence, experience and reason and science is based on evidence, experience and reason, you say, well, the danger with the pseudoscientific method where you only look for information that proves you right and ignore information that proves you wrong. The danger in that is due to the fact that there are many counterintuitive things that exist within math and science that you would not naturally think of. It, right. It's counterintuitive. It works against the way you would naturally think of things. Right. Examples of uh, these counterintuitive concepts is the fact that two objects of different mass fall at the same rate. Right. If you take a bowling ball and a feather, you would expect that those two objects of different mass would fall at different rates. But the reality is counterintuitive. Those two objects of different mass fall at the same rate. A uh, counterintuitive example from mathematics is the fact that 0.99999 repeating can be mathematically proven to be the same thing as one. It's counterintuitive, right? But if you were to utilize pseudoscientific thinking, you wouldn't be able to arrive at those conclusions. And because we know that these counterintuitive examples exist, scientists have learned to be skeptical of their findings. Because they're very well aware of human error, right? 
So as a scientist, it's always necessary to go back and reevaluate your assumptions, right? Confirmation bias is a thing and it's dangerous. So again, it's important to note that science does not mean always being right. Just because you're, you're utilizing sci the scientific method, you're following science, does not mean that you're going to always be right. In fact, you're going to be wrong more often than you are right. But what happens is when you do utilize science and you are right, you can have a certain level of statistical confidence in the fact that you're right. It's possible to do correct science and yield a wrong result. That's perfectly fine because it adds value. The added value is now you know what doesn't work. Now you know whatever that thought was that you had is not a correct explanation. And it's possible to do pseudoscience and get a correct result. The difference is when you practice a pseudoscientific method and you get a correct result, that just means that you got lucky. <laughs> Right. It just means there really isn't any information that refutes your idea, but you didn't actively go out there and look for it. You know what you're taught when you follow the scientific method is that whenever you're wrong, whenever you're incorrect, that gives you the opportunity to learn. You learn. You basically you learn from your failure. They all they, they say that the the you have to learn to lose before you learn to win. That's what you learn in sports. Right. And that's the same. That's the same lesson that you learn when you follow the scientific method. Show me someone who has never been wrong and I'll show you someone who has never learned. The concept of being all wise, right and exact means that that being has never learned anything. Right. Omniscience is a fallacy. Even God in the Bible <laughs> made mistakes. Right. You know, in Genesis, God had to create something and look at it to see that it was good. You know what I'm saying? Which means that there was a possibility that it may not have been good. Right. Then there are other points in Genesis where God had to destroy his bad creations. He said, oh, it, you know, it, it didn't work out. <laughs> God made a mistake. It didn't work out the way that he intended. So he had to scratch it all and start over. He regretted. Right. So even though pseudoscience creates those win-win scenarios, you know, and it, it feeds your ego in, in that you, you found information that prove yourself right. It robs you of the ability to learn from your mistakes, to learn from your failures, to learn from losing, right? And this gets into the personalities that the scientific method gives birth to versus the pseudoscientific method, right? What you notice amongst people who follow a scientific method, they have a willingness to be proven wrong. They're not closed minded to ideas without seeing evidence. They're willing to listen and hear all information from all sides, either confirming or refuting. And because of this, scientists, when you listen to scientists talk, they usually speak in terms of probability, likelihood, statistics. They'll talk about what's most likely, what's probable. You know, scientists don't speak in terms of absolutes. They speak in terms of probability. Pseudoscientists, however, because the pseudoscientific method gives birth to win-win scenarios, always proving yourself right. It builds confidence within the personalities who adhere to that methodology. And so they speak in terms of absolutes. They're always certain, right? They're always certain. They're certain of this and they're certain of that. And because of that, they're also closed minded. They're unwilling to listen and hear and entertain opposing ideas. They're unwilling to entertain contradicting and refuting information. Pseudoscientists make very good leaders because they, they speak with confidence. You know, you take two people, one person who speaks in terms of absolutes, 100 percent, definitely, versus another person who says, well, it's most likely, it's, it's probable. <laughs> you would instinctively want to go with the person who's speaking with with more confidence who is more certain about what they're saying so pseudoscience breeds very confident leaders who speak in terms of absolutes they tend to be loud and they tend to be wrong loud and wrong right the dichotomy is the humble modest and reserved scientists versus the loud egotistical brave bold and charismatic pseudoscientists but as we will talk about later the pseudoscientific method and the personalities that it breeds the appeal of it the appeal 
that people have to other people who may be practicing a pseudoscientific methodology and the appeal that the pseudoscientific methodology has in general is all based on evolution. There's an evolutionary explanation for the appeal of pseudoscience. And you know what's crazy about that is that people who promote pseudoscientific ideas are simultaneously evolutionary deniers. <laughs> they deny evolutionary theory based on a pseudoscientific method, but their attraction to that pseudoscientific method is explained scientifically through evolution. Wow. <laughs> oh boy. So let's keep let's keep moving, right? So one thing that has to be considered you know, before we can qualify somebody as a pseudo, right, you have to ask the question, how many instances of promoting pseudo information, misinformation, and how many instances of following a pseudo scientific method, how many instances must occur before we can objectively qualify someone as a pseudo, right? And so one thing I always tell people, or one thing that they say in college is C's get degrees, which basically means that you can be wrong 30% of the time. You can have a 70% average. You can be wrong 30% of the time, have a C average, a 2.0, and get a bachelor's degree in the American academia system. You can be wrong 20% of the time, have a 80% average, a B average, a 3.0, and get a graduate degree, a master's or a PhD. So since between 20 and 30% of the time you can be wrong in the American academia system and still have a degree, I think that should be the standard for being able to ob objectively qualify somebody as a pseudo. But, you know, in order to do that, not only do you have to identify all the instances of that individual being wrong, you also have to, you know, you're grading papers, you have to count up, you have to tally, you have to count up the number of instances that that individual is right also, right, and do the math and then you can objectively say, you know, who's a pseudo and who's not. So now that we understand the pseudoscientific method, basically looking for information to prove yourself right, ignoring information that proves you wrong. What are the different places where pseudoscience manifests itself? Well, in debates, right? When, when, when two people debate, what do they do? They, they have their idea. They go out and they look for all the information that supports their position. And they go out and they look for all the information that disproves their opponent's position, but they don't necessarily look for information that disproves their own position, right? So at the foundation of debate preparation is a pseudoscientific methodology. Where else does pseudoscience manifest itself? In conspiracies, right? Conspiracy theories are based on pseudoscience because, again, Pseudoscience is based on evidence. Every good conspiracy theory can provide you with evidence about why whatever theory that they're talking about is correct. If flat earth believers, they can provide you with evidence and information in support of their idea. The whole problem with that is that they ignore, again, the pseudoscience. They ignore information that refutes it. They don't have all the information to really make up an idea because they've ignored a large part of the pie. How else does pseudoscience ma uh, manifest itself? We find pseudo the pseudoscientific method within racism. What is racism? Racism is a set of beliefs that someone has based on race. They go out, they look for information that proves their belief right. Whatever, whatever racist belief that they have. Any, t any time that there's evidence in support of their racist belief, they say, aha, see, that's an example. That's why, that's why I think this about this person of this race. But they simultaneously ignore the information which disproves those beliefs. Where else does the pseudoscientific method manifest itself? In court. In court, our very legal system is based on a pseudoscientific method. Both sides, the prosecution and the defense, utilize the information for their own means. It's just like the debate. They utilize the information to prove their side right. They make an attempt to prove the other side wrong, but there's no, there's no self accountability. There's no self checking method. And then in the end, the jury is told to make a decision based on the preponderance of evidence, meaning which side was more convincing. See, when you have when you have information, you, when you have an idea, right, and you have information in support of and refuting 
the idea. You have you have to envision a scale, right? On one side of the scale, there's information supporting the concept, supporting the hypothesis. On the other side of the scale, there's information refuting the hypothesis. Again, this is why in the um, the symbol that I use for experimentation, the data information and data collecting step of the scientific method, it's a scale, right? Because it's at that point where information either in support of or refuting or falsifying where information is weighed. And sometimes it, it could be equal. Sometimes it could be only slightly leaning in one direction or the other. And sometimes, you know, when you're able to speak in terms of highly probable and highly likely, there's more information that's favorable of the idea than there is information that's disfavorable of the idea, right? So those are, those are the different conditions, different examples where the pseudoscientific method manifests itself. But I really feel like this portion of the discussion will really add some insight into the science of pseudoscience. This portion of the discussion is about the practical and impractical application of pseudoscience. So, again, when you study science, when you study nature, you realize that there are a lot of counterintuitive things that exist within nature. One of those counterintuitive things is this dichotomy between science and pseudoscience in terms of the practical and impractical application. You would think that scientific thinking would be the only way to go, would be the, the most intelligent methodology of thinking 100% of the time. But there are actually instances where scientific thinking can be detrimental. And this and this insight really sat me down. I really I was supposed to do this video about a year ago and I, I wrestled with this particular point until I was able to make peace with it. Right. At this point, I want to uh, insert a clip from a conversation that Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson was having with Dr. Richard Dawkins at the Hayden Planetarium. And after listening to this clip, I want to come back to the discussion. Uh, just talk about the, the human mind's capacity to know and to think and to believe. You know, I look at how much trouble people have with mathematics, typically, if there's any one subject that the most number of people say I was never good at, insert a topic, it's going to be math. And so I say to myself, if our brain were wired for logical thinking, then math would be everyone's easiest subject. And everything else would be harder. So I ha I'm kind of forced to conclude that our brain is not wired for logic. It's a very good point. And it's more than just that. I think there's also a kind of unwarranted pride in being bad at mathematics. Uh -huh. uh, you will never hear anybody saying how proud that they are of being ignorant of Shakespeare right. uh, or Dryden. Um, but people, plenty of people will say they are, they are proud of being ignorant of, of uh, mathematics. Or if they don't use the word proud, they'll say, I was never good at math. Ha 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 ha. Yeah, they'll chuckle that, about it. That, it becomes right. a joke. Um, there was a thing in, in one of the British newspapers where a, there was a science writer, I think a science journalist, was lamenting the fact that many people in Britain uh, think it takes one month for the Earth to orbit the Sun. And the editor then inserted there, doesn't it, Ed? <laughs> uh, so he was, as it were, say, saying, you know, I'm the editor of a national newspaper. And of course, I don't really think it takes, but nevertheless, I, it's okay to make a joke about being ignorant of this very <laughs> elementary mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, point of astronomy which he would never ever do about being, you know, con confusing, confusing Byron with Virgin or, or, or something like that. Right, and, and, or ever be proud of such a thing. So, so then you must admit or confess that we as a human organism must have a great challenge before us to think rationally, logically, scientifically. Yeah, I mean, you made the very interesting point that maybe we're not wired to be good at logic. Well, you generalized from mathematics to logic. Yeah, I did, but, but, um, but for this conversation, I yeah, think we can um, claim that. Certainly, many, many people are extremely illogical, but... Um, and they, by the way, they get along just fine in life. They live long, long lives, yeah. and 
But I think it's an interesting point that our, that our wild ancestors needing to survive in the, in the presence of lions and drought and famine and things, you'd think logic would be pretty important for survival. <laughs> If, I, if not mathematics, at least. Well, well, it could be maybe early people who said, oh, there's a creature there with big teeth. Let me investigate it further. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, in a way, that's right. The, being some too level, scientific is, is a bad thing. Uh, uh, curiosity yeah. doesn't always work. Um, my, uh, I had a cousin as a, who was a, a little boy, uh, put his finger in the, the, in the mains and got a shock. So he did it again just to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> He's a real scientist. <laughs> But not very good for survival. Right, right. So perhaps the 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 gut reaction of to run or to be scared or to to chant or I mean I guess what I'm getting at is there's so much of human civilization that derives not from logical thinking but from what we might sim simply call illogical thinking. Illogical thinking and I mean art. You know, I've got Van Gogh on the wall. No one's going to quiz him and say, how logical were you when you painted The Starry Night? And so, what does it mean to object, then, to people who feel this way? Because I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm more... I detach myself more from that battle than you do. You are, you are on the front lines. And I'm way in the back line watching you do this. And, and I'm saying, sometimes people just want to feel rather than think. Yes, uh, I'm, I keep pushing back to the evolutionary origins of this and, and when you have to survive in a, in a hostile environment it may be that you do need a certain amount of illogical uh, gut. Yes, it may be that you need to fear things which logic tells you but maybe it's a matter of the, of the odds that, that, that something is actually dangerous. Um, or the cost to you, the, if it is. The cost is. to you. If, 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 you see, if you see a sort of rustling in the trees, um, it, it could be a, a leopard about to jump on you. But it's much more likely to be the wind, and, and the, the, the logical, rational explanation is probably it's the wind. But when your survival depends upon the, the remote possibility, well, not remote, right, the, the, the rather lower pr probability that it might be, a leopard. The prudent thing is to be uh, more risk averse than than a, than a than statistics justify. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So okay. So now we have a world where we're kind of we're prisoners of this sort of genetic molding that has occurred. All right. So in that clip, you heard the two scientists discussing a potential evolutionary explanation for what they called non-scientific thinking, right? But when you really look at what they were describing, they were talking about the pseudoscientific method. They were talking about pseudoscientific thinking. They were talking about our ancestors looking for information which proved the hypothesis correct. And that hypothesis was something is dangerous. Whatever that thing is that I see right there is dangerous. And rather than attempting to falsify that hypothesis rather than investigating to see hmm is that thing actually dangerous it was actually evolutionarily better to be pseudo to be pseudo to be a pseudoscience and just assume that that thing is dangerous use utilize whatever information oh yep it's wrestling that must be something dangerous and run the other way they live another day utilizing a pseudoscientific method wow so I also want to direct you to um, another video, which I'll link in the description. The video is talking about the real reason why conspiracy theories work. Right. And within that video, they talk about something called adaptive conspiracism hypothesis, which is basically the same thing that we just described, where our ancient ancestors, when it came down to self-preservation, when it came down to whether something that they were experiencing in the wild was dangerous or not, it was actually more advantageous to utilize a pseudoscientific method to look for information which proves the hypothesis correct that it is dangerous 
than it was to use a scientific method and try to falsify that that hypothesis and go over there and see is that shit actually dangerous and end up dead. <laughs> right? Evolutionary perspective, biologists hypothesize that we've been programmed to fall for conspiracy theories as a protective measure. As hunter-gatherers, violence was a common cause for danger, and so being able to identify conspirators became an evolutionary advantage. This theory was eventually developed into something that smart academics refer to as the adaptive conspiracism hypothesis. The hypothesis is essentially this. If you're walking in the jungle and you see a snake, <laughs> but it's actually just a stick. Okay, that's embarrassing, but you're still alive. Phew. But if you're walking in the jungle and you see a stick, <laughs> no biggie, but it's actually a snake. Okay, oops, you step on it, it bites you, now you're dead. This explains how our brains have been programmed into thinking better safe than sorry when it comes to survival. And so, and you know, what's funny about it is there's a, um, there's a comedian, I think it might be Saturday Night Entertainer who talks about that, right? He says, the difference between black people and white, we say if, they, if, if there's a group of black people and just one person just takes off running, <laughs> everybody else is going to take off running. They're not going to ask any questions. They're just going to take off running. And after they get away from whatever it was that's dangerous, then they'll ask the question, well, what, what, what were we running for? Right. Versus uh, white people, they'll actually walk towards the danger and try to investigate well what's going on right and within that dichotomy you actually see the difference between science and pseudoscience and um how one could be advantageous and one can be detrimental when it comes to self-preservation what's deep about it is that self-preservation is what they call the first law of nature and it is a pseudoscientific thought process again that process is based on evidence it's based on experience and it's based on inductive and abductive reasoning. It might not be based on deductive reasoning, but it is based on a form of reasoning. But it's a pseudoscientific methodology where it's a, it creates a win-win scenario. You survive. You live another day. <laughs> right? So if pseudoscience is for self-preservation, then I would say science is for survival. Right? You utilize science to create, to develop, to build. You utilize science for your food, your clothing, your shelter, your medication. This is why we see the earliest example of the scientific method on a medical papyrus from ancient Kemet, right? But what's deep about it is this simple insight, it shows that there is value even in, pseudo, in a pseudoscientific methodology. And... This is coming from scientifically studying pseudoscience. You can find the value in a pseudoscientific methodology. Let's think about um, the story of Eve and the snake in the Bible. In the story of Eve or the Bible, God told Eve not to eat from the tree of knowledge. And if you, in the day you do so, you will surely die. Then the snake came behind God and told Eve, if you eat from that tree, you will not surely die. Now, Eve has two competing hypotheses. One hypothesis is, if she eats from the tree, she dies. And the other hypothesis is, if she eats from the tree, she will not die. Now, here's the strange thing about this story, if you believe that it is true. Eve actually follows a scientific method. She does the experiment. <laughs> She had two, at the point when she had two competing hypotheses, you eat it, you die, you eat it, you don't die. She rolled the dice on it, I eat it, I, I might die. She, and she bit into the apple. <laughs> right? Now, had, had God been telling the truth, then that would have been the end of Eve at that point. So that story is an example of how in, in reality, in practice, has she followed a pseudoscientific method? And just listen to God, you know, because if you follow the pseudoscientific method and just listen to God, if I eat that apple, it'll die. When you looked at the apple, any little blemish on the apple would have been enough to be like, yep, you see that brown spot right there? I think if I bite that apple, it'll kill me. I'm good. I'm not going to eat it. That's a pseudoscientific method. But she actually conducted a scientific method. She did the experiment. She bit into the apple to see will it kill her or will it not kill her, right?
one thing people talk about when it comes to self-preservation um, and science and pseudoscience, people talk about the paralysis and the analysis, right? When you follow a scientific method, it, it involves a lot of analysis, a lot of analytical thinking. And for our, for our ancestors in the wild, they didn't have time to do that. You had to react. You had to work on instinct. And sometimes that meant following a pseudoscientific methodology that that involved looking for information to prove the hypothesis correct that whatever that is, is dangerous and I shouldn't mess with it. But in utilizing that methodology, they lived another day. And because they lived another day, they passed down through evolution a reality that makes us at this point in time very susceptible to pseudoscientific thinking and very susceptible to leaders who follow a pseudoscientific methodology and the personality that that gives birth to. Self-preservation is essentially the process of an organism preventing itself from being harmed or killed and is considered a basic instinct in most organisms. Self-preservation may also be interpreted figuratively in regard to the coping mechanisms one needs to prevent emotional trauma from distorting the mind. So, so check it. Let, let's, let's unpack that as they say, right? You're trying to preserve your sense of self. So over time, people have collected different ideas, different thoughts about who they are and their world. And to disprove those things, to find out that certain, as certain, certain aspects of those things are false or not true, because their sense of self is based on those thoughts and ideas, to disprove those ideas is actually an assault on who that individual is as a person. So that's why sometimes you get this reaction where if you disagree with someone or you, you disprove you will attempt to disprove something that someone says. They feel like they say you're attacking me, right? Anybody who's done their share of debating has experienced this, where the person reacts as if you're attacking them versus the idea or the concept. And that's because the person's, their sense of selfhood is based on that idea. So in order to preserve their sense of self, again, the self-preservation, in, in order to preserve their sense of self, they start utilizing a pseudoscientific methodology, which we just discussed through evolution, was able to uh, provide self-preservation. They start utilizing that pseudoscientific methodology to preserve their sense of self. That pseudoscientific methodology becomes a defense mechanism. An unconscious psychological mechanism that reduces anxiety from arising from potentially harmful stimuli. In psychoanalytic theory, defense mechanisms are psychological strategies brought into play by the unconscious mind to manipulate, deny, or distort reality in order to defend against feelings of anxiety and unacceptable impulses and maintain one's self schema or other schemas. So now we so now we get it. Now we can see why the pseudoscientific method comes up so frequently when you challenge ideas that are the foundation of people's sense of self, their identity. So we have a pseudoscientific methodology which has been passed down to us through evolution as a method for self-preservation, believe it or not. We have a pseudoscientific methodology that gives birth to personalities which we innately as human beings, again through evolution, see as leaders, very confident, charismatic individuals who we would want to be leaders. And then the cherry on top, let's talk about the role of pseudoscience in nation building, right? So because the pseudoscientific methodology gives birth to the personalities that we see as leaders, those leaders are able to galvanize people, to bring people together for the purpose of building nations. Then when we study history, we find that when nations are built, the pseudoscience, the pseudoscientific ideas essentially become you have these things that they call a noble lie or a pious fiction. Right. These are fictitious ideas that are promoted amongst the masses of people. 
Within uh, ancient Kemet, it's either in the book Black Genesis or Imhotep the Architect, I don't remember. But it talks about how there were certain myth mythologies, certain concepts that were accepted by the nation as a whole, where the priesthood, the people like the people around Imhotep, they had, they had a different understanding. They had a they had a more scientific understanding of those concepts but for the vast majority of the population they knew it and understood it as a mythology we find the same type of dichotomy that exists in the foundation of america right whereas the majority of america at its foundation were christian and they believed in the set of christian mythologies the founding fathers were members of various uh secret societies who had a they had a different interpretation of those mythologies than the vast majority of Americans. A more scientific based interpretation of those mythologies than the majority of America. Um, even when you talk to people who were members of uh, Malachi York's organization, they say that, you know, within the majority of people in the organization, they believed and accepted the mythologies within his organization, they took them at face value. But within the inner circle, the closer, the closer group of brothers, they had a different interpretation, a different understanding of those mythologies. But the takeaway, the thing is that even in nation building, we find that pseudoscience, the pseudoscientific method had its role in the building of our various nations over time. I think going forward, the challenge for us as a people is to build a nation that's based on science, build a nation that's based on the scientific method. But we can guard ourselves against that persuasive and pervasive schema that is pseudoscience. I think I think the takeaway from this discussion is this. When you study nature, you find that there are there are things that exist in nature that can be detrimental when applied in some instances and can be beneficial when applied in different instances. I think a perfect example of that dichotomy is um, penicillin because at its discovery penicillin was was mold right and in certain applications in certain instances it could be detrimental to the person but through through the use of science we were able to find a practical application where penicillin could be beneficial. And that's the same type of lesson that we learn when we scientifically investigate pseudoscience. That in history, there was, a, there was an actual evolutionary benefit to utilizing pseudoscientific methodology for self-preservation. But we also have to recognize that methodology is detrimental and can lead to conclusions which are detrimental when we attempt to apply it in other places, in other areas of our life. I thank you for your time and attention. And I would like to close out by saying, let us use our minds to discover the science to accept the things we cannot change. Technology to engineer the things we can and the mathematics to know the difference. Peace.